All right, we're good. All right, we are letting everyone in. We are broadcasting live on Facebook because we are such a tech forward company. I wonder if we should potentially start calling ourselves a technology company now that we're embracing going live on Facebook. I think it only makes sense. I'll have to talk hey, to Brad about that. That works so well for Keller Williams. I think you should absolutely do that. <laughs> I think it only makes sense. Anyway, the gentleman you just heard is my friend, Brad Miklovich, and um, he is a very good friend of Brett's as well and a private client of Brett's. They've worked together for years. And so as we are launching and growing into this Lessons of Be Wealthy, it only makes sense that we have um, Brad as one of our featured members. In addition to the fact that everything that's going on in the world right now um, and all of the change and transition that we're seeing, there's a lot of opportunity out there. And in a little bit, Brad's going to go into some areas of opportunity that he sees and that he and his business are pursuing. And the reason that that is so um, important for us to hear from Brad is because of Brad's background and a lot about him. So before I go into too much of spilling all of the, the Brad beans, um, I will let my friend Brad introduce himself. So Brad, in just a few minutes, tell us a little bit about yourself, your business, where do you live? Is it just under a whiteboard or is there a geographic location too? No, I just live right here under this whiteboard. I was pigeonholed into my office today. There's an army of people coming in to, I don't know, they're bringing lunch for 50 and I'm now stuck inside this closet with a whiteboard. So <laughs> here I am. I'm actually in Northeastern Ohio. Uh, I'm a dude who comes from a small town, not raised with a whole lot of money, not a whole lot of teaching. Um, I was born this way. Like you'll hear a lot of stuff today and you, you'll, you'll understand, you'll ask, you know, where'd you learn this stuff? And I don't know. I was born this way. So went to small high school, graduated with uh, a 500. So decent sized high school in a small town, ran a couple businesses in high school construction companies. I would be the guy that left at lunch to go pick up the homeless guy to go take him to the job site, to stand <laughs> on the stairs, come back to school go back to the job, pay them in beer and JoJo's at age 16, and then go to the job site. Um, from there, went to the University of Toledo, opened up some restaurants, ran some bars, ran some country clubs, uh, did some uh, small investing at the time. Uh, we were buying college rentals on terms. Got a degree in finance, and I built a degree in commercial real estate. So I was, me and my buddy were the first two people to go through the University of Toledo after building a commercial real estate degree. It still stands today. So <clears throat> that's still there. And what did we do from there? Then I went, uh, after I got my finance, well, I was still getting my finance degree, about 20 years old, became a stockbroker, uh, was recruited from a guy at the country club to come run, well, help him run a hedge fund in the commodity world. And he called me and said, hey, Brad, um, you were great um, at the club. We love what you did. Your energy is insane. Um, would you come work with us at the hedge fund? I go, guys, I know nothing about commodities, but uh, I'm in. I, I know I've, everything I've done thus far, I've become the best at what I did at it. So why don't we go give it a run? Started that, it started there late uh, in my year 20, turned 21 there. And when I was handed the accounts of some of the world's largest food producers, where I was in charge of running billions of dollars of risk for the largest chicken egg producers in the world. Is that the same company that just announced they're moving to Arkansas? No, these companies are all defunct now. They've all been oh. collapsed. Uh, it was uh, when the great fallout came from all of the Dodd-Frank and all of this, it all came collapsing to an end. Gotcha. Uh, but great run, did that for seven, eight years, made hundreds of millions of dollars for some of the largest food producers. Some of the Eastern European countries, I represented their risk in currency, bonds, and their grain risk. Uh, spent a lot of time in Finland and Sweden, uh, traveling by train and meeting with uh, some of those folks. And in 2013, I came back to the real estate side on the other side of the recession. And I had zero plans of selling houses ever. I was looking at some investment properties with my real estate agent, and I was gonna go run uh, a commercial shop down the road. And I, I, would, I was, at that point I was 25, 27, I was actually 27 years old. And they told me I'd be making about $150,000 after about a year and a half in the business. And after a year in the hedge fund industry, I didn't think that would be uh, too great. My wife was already used to living a certain type of lifestyle. So I didn't think that was gonna work. Um, they introduced my agent, asked me if I'd come work for his team at Keller Williams. And I was like, 
sell houses. I'm like, I'm not a house selling guy. But then I, I jumped in, started doing research on YouTube. And uh, Ben Kinney was out there. And Ben Kinney was not running the business Ben Kinney's running today. He was still the guy selling houses. So I jumped in. I was like, man, this guy seems to be making some money. Uh, and it seems like it's like a real business. Maybe I can do this. So I got into the business called um, old client of mine, Dan Gilbert, who ran Quicken Loans, owns the Cavs, another billionaire. He plugged me in with one of my college roommates. Every deal in 2013 for Quicken Loans that came through Cleveland came to me. Um, sold 89 homes my first year of real estate, uh, did that with them for two years, and started a team in 2015 after Dan Gilbert started what's now known as in-house realty, where they take 35, 40% of uh, referrals when I was in because next to nothing, if it was nothing. Um, started my team in 2015, ran really, really hard, selling 100 some odd homes for X number of years. Was lucky enough to sit next to Linda McKissick. Uh, on a bus tour at Mega Camp, and she's like, "Hey, you need to get a coach." I'm like, "Yeah, I know I need a coach, but I'm not. I don't need rah rah. I don't need mindset, and I need someone that actually is a producer and does big things." And I was having some issues in a, in a market center uh, called Jason Abrams. Jason helped me out with my issue. He's like, "Hey, you guys were just starting metrics. Uh, you get you should come down to this metrics event." I'm like, "Ah, oh, cool. I'll check it out." Um, met all you guys, Brett. Um, Found out that's exactly, those were the guys who were actually doing the things I was looking for. Um, started coaching with Brett shortly thereafter. And today we have an entire sales organization. I was a guy in those rooms going, oh, I don't know what to do. I'm selling 120 homes myself. I have like three agents. I suck at managing. What do I do? And they're like sales manager, sales manager, sales manager. A couple of years ago, I hired that person. Um, we have I think 16 agents in-house right now. Uh, and then we have 37 signed up um, for our group now. So that should take us close to 50 uh, here by the year's end. Wow. Uh, on the retail side, I run our investment team. Uh, last year, we booked uh, just over 30 million in ownership uh, that we owned 189 doors, I think that equated to uh, on the investment side. And then we were at the Zenith, we were averaging about 30 acquisitions per month was the zenith of our purchasing in the heyday of buying houses for no money and doing next to nothing and selling them for a lot of money. So I'm a through and through, long story short, of I'm just an arbitrage guy. I'm looking for the market of the moment. And that's, the, yeah. that's who I am today. Which explains there was some things that I took some notes on because I noticed some trends there that are really interesting in your background. You're learning you're learning based in formal education and on the streets, right? Yep. So while you were in I'm school, a guy. yeah, whether it was, yeah, but you, I mean, you did just tell us you pioneered an entire new degree path in a university, in a major university. It did so happen. I would say you're not afraid of a classroom either. Well, I did so teach at collegiate uh, class as well. We try, I taught global uh, derivatives trading uh, while I was in school for Cool. I rest I rest my case. So you marry those together, which I think is really important. A lot of us stay either in the classroom and never take action, or we're just running in the streets with scissors um, and don't match and marry it with proven systems and strategies. So I thought that was really, really cool. The other thing I really liked was um, just like you said, you're, you're an arbitrage guy. So you're looking at the market of the moment, right? And so all of your pivots that you have made in your career were right at the precipice of when that opportunity existed. If you've read, obviously, Malcolm Gladwell's Tipping Point, it's all about being in that, or seeing the outliers, it's all about being in that market at the moment, recognizing it and having that initial opportunity. And obviously, the grit and the hard work behind that, married with it's super interesting. Um, also, your relationships. I thought that was pretty cool. Your relationship with the country club got you into yep. the head fund. Your relationship with the Quicken, Quicken Loans got you off the ground and running. And it is super fast paced. Um, I just, I learned a lot by by seeing all of that braid together into the success you have today. So yep. thanks for sharing it's that. All it's all relationships. So with the question is, where do we want to go from here? I want to, I want to yeah. provide value for folks. Um, I don't want to just share about me because I think that's boring. Um, but I do want to kind of lead with, hey, I know a couple of things. I have a background in finance. I have a background in stuff. Um, but I'm a man of the streets. I, I didn't share with you in high school. I was the, the bookie for the high school, including all the principals. So I'm a man of the streets. 
Not surprising. All right. Yeah. So share with us. You're obviously looking at our, you know, you're, you're an arbitrage guy. You're always looking at the opportunity of the moment. And a lot of the people on this call are obviously all business owners in the real estate space. Some are investors, some are retail real estate agents, all at different levels, um, feeling this transition and wondering where do we go from here? Where will the big opportunities be? So what are you saying? So uh, for me, I've been asking myself that question since about April of this year. I think if you look back on my Facebook, I said, hey, Easter, I said, don't, don't walk your real estate agent's office, run to it. And this is the precipice peak of the real estate market. And I, I think that has proven to be the, the truth. Um, so the market right now, if you look around the country, I think we are collapsing in some areas. Uh, parts of Seattle and California, I know, are already down 20%. But when you're up 300%, what's 20%, it's all a kind of microcosm of certain markets. I know Arizona is getting hammered, but again, you also ran up a lot higher than what we did here in Northeastern Ohio. When I look at our numbers, we're still up, we're down 6% from the precipice, which was Easter, but we're still up 14.4% year over year. Our days on market hasn't changed. Our inventory is still really, really short. We're a month and one day of inventory on the market in the real estate market. But if you think about where we've been, and I think a lot of us have really made a fortune over the last three years, and we think about what the Fed's doing today and why we're in the situation we are today, and we got to kind of get a full grasp of what that is. And we look at Fed policy, and I'm not going to go write all over my whiteboard. You probably can't see it real well. Um, but you look at Fed policy and where we're at today. So the Fed is hiking interest rates. And if you look at their last comments, they're pretty much going right back to Volcker and saying, hey, we're going to make interest rates so high that it makes business restrictive. You're forced to lay people off and there's going to be a lot of pain. Those are some pretty harsh words from a guy who said inflation is transitory. And Fed, they're this, you know, they're, they're supposed to be this, their own little pioneer place, and they're supposed to think from themselves. Well, it was transitory until he was reelected uh, by the Biden administration, the only one elected by Trump who is still left. Imagine that. Gets reelected for his term, and now we're actually going to figure out what the issues are. But the issues aren't, I think, around inflation from the common sense of we just have so much demand and we have all this stuff. We have a real issue with people. We don't have people to build the things. And a lot of that stemmed from a couple of things. One was you can't shut down the world economy via COVID and expect things to go okay. By sending everyone home, you cause everyone, well, a lot of people to quit their jobs. You caused a lot of people to start questioning what they did for a living. And then you also started ZERP, zero interest rate policy. When yeah. rates are zero, people go insane buying things. Look at tech. What happened with technology? You had companies out there like Sequoia going out and all these large funds making offers on all these tech companies and no one was doing due diligence. They just saw, oh, Somebody's making an offer, somebody else comes in 10% higher and another 10% higher without doing the due diligence until the multiples on these companies were 300 times forward earnings at zero. That is not a sustainable market. So if you look today and you went to any of these tech companies and you found out, are they trying to raise money? You're going to find out they can't raise money. So we're in this market today where the Fed is trying to raise rates to get us out of this issue when we really need to be solving the issue of people. And I think a lot of this has to do with the last three administrations policy on immigration. This entire country was built on the back of immigrants starting in you know, the 1920s. We built this entire country on immigrants. And back when Obama was president, we essentially kind of eliminated that. I mean, you could listen to the news and you'll hear millions of people are coming across the border. Okay, that might be a fact, but why do we think that it is? Why do we think that the border is wide open? I think a lot of mistakes people make is they just listen to the news, they listen to the headlines, and if they're right wing, they only listen to the right wing news, and if they're left wing, they only listen to left wing news. And maybe you gotta dig a little bit deeper. You gotta think of why these policies are. Well, I'll tell you one thing, the biggest scam ever told to people was in the 1930s when they started social security. Yeah. And today, if you were to look at social security numbers, they're going to run out within the next decade. Correct. 
Okay, so we're going to run out in the next decade. And in the middle of this inflation boom, we have a bunch of people who are going to run out of money. Mm -hmm. And less people paying in. Less people paying in. More people staying home, less people on W-2 income, so less people paying into Social Security as well, which is only accelerating the issue. We have a major issue there. Gary, I was talking to Brad, Gary Keller's biggest fear right now is the collapse of the middle class. Mm -hmm. And we, I think we all see that coming. But I don't think, like Gary said this, is they don't go quietly. When you collapse them, they come with pitchforks. And when people find out that Social Security was the biggest Ponzi scheme of all time, maybe this whole switch between the right wings and the left wings is orchestrated by the government. So we start fighting each other instead of fighting them when this whole thing comes. So there's a lot of things at play. Federal Reserve policy, you would say, hey, their, their mandate is number one, full employment and to keep inflation low. So they started zero interest rate policy. The one thing, again, they will sell that on the news. You have to dig a little bit deeper when you think about that and think what Federal Reserve's policy really is. Federal Reserve is the largest salesman on the planet of their thing. And they sell the US dollar. There is no product in the world that people want more than the US dollar. We could devalue it and print them like we have for the last gazillion years. And guess what people still want? The US dollar. I can't go to China and buy a barrel of crude oil without exchanging my money for the US dollar. I can't go to Sweden and buy a bar of gold without exchanging it for the US dollar. The Federal Reserve's number one mandate is to protect the US dollar. Okay. And we'll go into the risks, but let's talk about, there was three people in the history of the world who have ever tried to take crude oil off the reserve policy. One, Saddam Hussein. Second, Muammar Gaddafi. What happened to those two people? By who? Oh. Not me personally, but no, us. The United you know who the third is? Vladimir Putin. Vladimir Putin is trying to take him off the, the US dollar off oil reserve. So the, one of the biggest contagion issues to this market is what's going on in Russia and Ukraine. And if you were to we were to have this conversation a week ago and you, you'd say, what do I think is gonna happen? I think the big thing in November and the argument we were going to have is how much money is the US willing to give Ukraine to let them give up the Donbass region. Because historically, I don't know that it matters that much to the rest of the world, but it does to Ukraine and it does to Russia in the water supply. They need that Donbass region. And how much we're willing to give Ukraine to rebuild so they give that up to Russia so they don't freeze out the rest of Europe with the Nord Stream pipeline by turning it off. Well, I don't know if anyone followed the news, but someone blew it up. Oh, I wonder who, how that happened. Yep, problem solved. So that, so that's that exit ramp is gone. Yeah. So now we're in a real predicament. So when we go into what's coming, some of the risks are we have the Ukraine Russia issue that needs to be solved. We can't you can't go jumping into the stock market. You can't go crazy buying stuff up until something like that's solved. And the stock market today is down thirty percent on Nasdaq and twenty two percent the S and P. And yes, I know we bounced. 5% over the last three days. Cool. This is what happened in markets that are in bear markets. You get 1,000 point up, 1,000 point down. Go look at the US bond market. The 10 year treasury is not supposed to move in 50 and 60 basis point moves every three days. This is a wild, wild market. And it feels a lot from a market standpoint, a lot like 2008 there. It's a roaring bear. That's number one. Number two issue you really need to be paying attention to, and if nobody's looked this up, you need to go do some research on the Chinese debt crisis. The Chinese debt crisis right now is the number one issue that I'm looking at that I think can collapse this thing and make the U.S. 2008 housing crisis look like child's play. So go do some, some research into the Chinese debt crisis, what's going on with people over in China. If you're to go build a condo, you have to give the developer your money, then they're going to go build the condos. Well, cool. They took the money. They're just not building. And people are starting to riot in the streets of China. China has went out to a bunch of smaller countries and lent the money in exchange to build stuff. Well, the people are just stopped paying. So there's a massive sovereign debt crisis going on and people paying China. 
And I know Ray Dalio came out with an incredible book. And if nobody's read the book, uh, Changing World Order, I think it was probably written a few months too early, but there's a lot of good things in there about China overtaking the U.S. and kind of the collapse of the middle middle class. I think there's a lot of great lessons to that book, but I would probably warn today, China's in a way worse position than the U.S. And then the second is- I would be surprised if an amendment came out from him. Yeah, to that book, 100%, because I think that is a major issue and they have major, major problems. The other things to start looking at is Watch what SoftBank's doing in their vision fund. They're already down 23 billion on the year, which is insanity. And now you're starting to see this week, you're starting to see Credit Suisse have some issues where their default bonds are, their credit default swaps are starting to go, wow. And it, it, it's starting to look like maybe one of these big ones can go under. So these are the things to watch when you start watching a bear market like this and what's the other side. Things need to break, companies need to go under and they need to either be this is where M&A is going to come. And don't be surprised Credit Suisse gets bought here in the next couple of weeks because things are probably looking pretty bleak. When this happened in eight, Lehman went on there. There was nobody left to buy them. Everybody else was already being crushed. Well, and I would argue that OPEC's recent announcement would accelerate two, if not three of those categories. 100%. And coupled with that, what's going on in Iran right now is very powerful. What the people in Iran are doing to try to overthrow that government should not be discounted. The U.S. needs to do what they're doing today to stay out of it because we're not really good at helping these countries. But as U.S. people, we need to support these folks because Iran was a great country. In my previous flight, I employed two Iranians who lived under Ahmadinejad. I'm very familiar with that. This Arab Spring that's going to, that's coming is could be super powerful and helpful for the United States. So to sum that all up, is the, as a country, going back to the Federal Reserve, the number one policy of the Federal Reserve is to protect that U.S. dollar. The dollar has never been stronger. We're now, the euro's under par. Right now, there are people, there's, a, there's about a 48% chance the British pound is going to become even with the U.S. dollar. Went from 150 that we've always been used to, to a dollar. Canadian dollars, we can go take a U.S. dollar and they'll get like a buck 30 in Canadian dollars. That's absolutely insanity. So for the U.S., we're in a great position for things to turn out really well if we make some really good decisions here. Well, so now, how do we make those? Well, I was about to say, let me ask this. So you just gave us, by the way, the world in 12 minutes, which was awesome. I know that that's an incredible amount of education, learning, analysis on your end, right? It's those two sides of learning. So one side, you, that's the formal education piece. But now can the Brad, who's a street hustler, tell us based on that information, what do we do? What do we have yes. control over? Where are our opportunities? How do we get in the streets, hustle, and make this opportunity great for us as the U.S. dollar is getting stronger? Yes. So that's, so that's, that's leading us to where we go from here. So awesome. the Federal Reserve is raising interest rates to the zenith if they have to. We'll see what happens after the election. But again, I think inflation comes down if we can solve the people part. So what we need to have happen is we need all these folks to come back to work. And if you read and listen to some folks, a lot of the, the wealth is tied up in the baby boomers. In fact, one seventh of the US or the world's wealth is tied up in 1% of the population, which is the US baby boomers. They control one seventh of the world's wealth is the baby boomers. And a lot of people will say that a lot of these younger folks who left the workforce, aren't in the workforce, are being supported by their parents. And their inflated stock values and their inflated homes, house prices. Because mom and dad have a $2 million house. Oh, and they also have a beach house. Federal yeah. Reserve's out to crush that. They need to take that away to get these people back to work. They said it. They said, we are going to force these companies to be forced to lay people off. Okay, cool. So we are moving. All the tech companies, they're starting, they have done, the majority have done yep. hiring freezes. And yep. I mean- bad example, but Peloton came out and said, we're letting, you know, 500 people go or 500, excuse me. Yes. Five, was that the right number? Yeah. 500. It was 12% of their workforce. So yeah, 500 people. Yeah. I, and I can send you, I don't know off the top of my head, but there's a, a website I follow for this. It follows tech company layoffs. And I will tell you, they are coming in droves. So there is a site that I follow. It's like layoffs, FYI dot something. Um, so layoffs are happening. Tech companies who that have been falsely bloated, right? Raised yep. money at rates that are ridiculous. So had incredible 
hiring and their expense load was not relevant to the income, right? It was based yep. upon their valuations. Then you have the kids who are at home hanging in their dad's beach house. How will they get back to work? Why now? Why will they get back to work now? Well, Kaylin, for the last couple of years, they've been sitting at mom and dad's beach house selling pants. They're selling uh, herbal. They're doing breath work online. That's not a real <laughs> thing. Like when the market changes and uh, people are losing their job, I'm sorry. It's just not real things. Like, yeah, I don't need $150 yoga pants sold from somebody online. I don't need healthcare advice and in, in beach coaching and how I'm going to look jacked from someone who's not jacked themselves. <laughs> okay. That's not a real job anymore. Like, it's fair. We don't but need Uber rated. Eats when you could drive there. Like these people yeah. are going to have to come back to real work. Okay. And a lot of these folks, and you have a lot of renters yourself, um, they were getting supported by the different programs. I mean, I, 18 people from mine stopped paying rent one month, two months ago, 18 people stopped paying rent. Yeah, over over the summer as subsidies went away, and obviously the majority of our stuff's in, in the Dallas Fort Worth area. Yep. As the city stopped the contribution over the summer, our conversation yep. previously, I was thinking the last sixty days. Over the summer, yes, there was, I would call it a ten percent ripple effect. One hundred percent. So these folks are starting to trickle back into the workforce. In fact, talking to our tenants, uh, the people who are getting these subsidies that are no longer getting, are say, "Hey, I went back to work. I got another job." So I think let's talk about how we've made money over the last um, three years. Hey, we're telling you, wipe this off. We've had a market that's gone like this, mm -hmm. straight up. It's been a straight up market. And for the last couple of years, I'll tell you exactly how we've done $30 million in holdings over the last, we'll call it 24. And we'll actually back up a step and we'll talk about why I did this. And I was in the investment space. COVID hit and uh, undercover billionaire started. That, this was a cool story. I know Kayla wanted me to share. I love this story. So undercover billionaire came out, Grant Cardone. And the, the whole thesis of the, the show is, hey, can Grant Cardone become Frank or whoever he was going to become and go make a million dollars out of nothing in six months? And I'm sitting there watching with my son and um, he was I don't know, five at the time, six. And he, no, he's probably six or seven. He goes, hey, do you think you could do that? And I said, I don't know. I go, how do we start from zero? He goes, well, you have money. I go, well, that's not going to work for me. But you know, who probably doesn't have a lot. Let's go ask mom. Mom doesn't have any companies. So let's start a company in May of 2020 uh, under my wife's name. And we started AMA Ohio Homes in two, May of 2020. And we started off with zero money. And we went out doing the things that we were already doing. Um, we were buying homes for what's called forty thousand, putting five thousand dollars into the house and selling them for eighty-five thousand dollars, essentially making a hundred percent on our money. And we were doing this to the tune of thirty times a month. But I didn't want to sandbag this operation by borrowing money from us, which is how we started the company. So we went to a bunch of our friends who already have money. This is everyone on this call. You're either the guy in the streets or you're the guy with money. Just marry you two together and let's figure out a way to go really fast and make a ton of money together. So yeah. when the market's going straight up, I'm an ex investment client. I never like that. I never showed my clients red ink ever. Like we always made money. And if we didn't, we took the trades. Like that's just the kind of weird operation we ran where we always made money. So I wanted to always do this for my investors today. So on the way up, we go to uh, Frank uh, and say, Frank, we got this deal here. You lend $40,000 for the deal. This is the first one we have to do, and we're going to put it right on the market because we need to get some cash in this company. If we're going to make a million dollars in six months, we got to make some cash. So what the first deal was, we bought it for 40, and I think we sold it for $62. And then okay. there was a $22,000 profit made there, and we split the profit 50-50. So I think we had 11, and then we did it again. And we said, I think we did two more times. Now. So investor put in the 40 grand or whatever it was, and maybe 30 grand. And then we did the work. And this is a model we ran for a long time where the investor puts in the money. We did all the work and then we split the profits 50-50. So then we did this. And then we ran into some subject twos. And then we ran into some creative financing. And mind you, the market's going straight up. So it didn't matter. Remember, everything was in multiples. You could put anything up for sale and it sold. 
and by November, the time we got together for the mastermind, I think I shared a story, that company went from zero to be worth $2.2 million. In the matter of May to November of 2020, that company went to 2.2, which I think is less than six months and more than $1 million. So can you do it 100% yes? And did Brad beat Grant? Yes. I think I did beat Grant. But, so it can be done. So then the model became, as this market's going straight up, I switched my model. And we had investors, um, I don't know, about $20 million worth of investors in our company. And I think it's really cool, really cool to get rid of your friends. Um, we switched our model. And some of our investors are like, ooh, are you getting greedy? Why are you doing this? Because I saw the market was about to pivot. And I thought, I think we started changing this about March of this year, where we stopped doing equity splits. When we started, when we were borrowing money from our investors, we were doing it essentially on a hard money basis. Yeah. So we went and bought a house for $100,000. They put in the capital, but they do it in the form of a loan. And we would pay them $1,000 for the money. We pay them interest only payments uh, at 10% interest. And a lot of folks at the time, I was talking to get out of the stock market. There's a lot of money that came out of the stock market that funded our deals. And they go, the market's going straight up. Why would I get out of summer? It's not going to go well. Like you start seeing inverse the yield curve. That's a sign of really bad things to come. And go look at the, the yield curve, the spread between the 10-year treasury and the two-year treasury. Oh, it's it's insanely inverted. Mm -hmm. Why would why would rates be 4% for two years and 3.5% for 30 years? Like that's not how a normal economy works. That's a sign of bad things. So we started doing this hard money. And uh, it worked out great. Everyone's making 10% interest payments. They're out of the stock market. They're not going down 30%, but instead their capital is still going up at 10%. And a lot of this stuff, we we're, we put renters in and we make you know 20% plus cap rates and it's great in all cap sales. Everybody makes a lot. A lot of people, when they hold real estate, they say, hey, there's going to be a lot of ups and downs and stuff like that. You know, it's a real estate market that goes like that. And when you research the billionaires, most of them made a lot of money in either A, real estate, or B, private equity. I think you'll find very few billionaires who made their money purely in the stock market. I just There's just not a lot of them. And during COVID, this was one of my things. I went and started reading the books on billionaires during COVID. I said, what was their game plan? What were they doing? And I went and was able to meet a lot of these folks and hear them speak and have conversations like this. Uh, have over lunch about where's the market going and how are you guys thinking about this? And as we went up, still making payments, and somehow we were about at this point in April, and we started selling 189 doors, $30 million worth of stuff as we had a year. We started, we didn't get the, the very top of everything, but as of today, I'd say we've trimmed half of our portfolio. And we're going to be down to about 60 doors here by the end of next month. Wow. Gonna, we've, you've seen a lot of the people that are real loud in real estate and, and the guys buying business get real quiet all of a sudden. You haven't seen them on social media for the last quarter. I promise you they've been selling. They've been selling. When Sam Zell came out and said, hey, um, I actually sold my company. Um, I have no real estate holding. I'm next to nothing. This is the lowest I've ever been. And Sam Zell is one of the guys I really like. That's my guy. You and me uh, when I point to, to the, we just kind of relate. I lived in one of Sam Zell's apartments in college. What? Uh, I, I find it out recently. He owned Campus Village, which was an apartment complex that I lived in in college. Um, when he's out, I'm out. And he said something really important when, taught, when he was asked about WeWork back in the heyday. And WeWork, you know, everyone knows that WeWork goes out, they lease office space, and they try to lease it to other people. And he was asked, what do you think of the valuation? And he laughed. He goes, somebody's been trying to do this model for 30 years and it's never worked. They go, but, but Sam, it's worth X billions of dollars. He goes, hey, call me when it turns to cash. And I went, ooh, that's pretty powerful. Call me when it turns to cash. And I'm looking at this net worth statement and all these properties. And I go, oh, I got a really great net worth on paper. Can I call somebody when it turns to cash? So his, my favorite saying in his book was the day the, um, when someone makes you, every day you choose to hold on to a piece of property is the day that you determine that you would buy it for that value again. Exactly. And yep. I mean, it was like, 
wild to me because we always go, oh, but I'm in love with that house or, oh, yeah. that reminds me of that year when I bought it. Yeah. And so now it's a great rental, but still sitting today, would you buy it for the price today or is it time to liquidate it? Turn it to cash. Yeah, you know, I asked myself that exact question. I looked at my portfolio and go, I wouldn't buy any of this stuff at this price. This is absolute <laughs> lunacy. We're selling all of it. Sell all of it. Sell as much as you humanly can. But I can't sell everything. We all know it. As much as we want to liquidate, we can't sell everything because it's really cool. But what if you could sell here and then buy again right here? Like right. we're all in the real estate space. Why? Just because it's great to hold real estate through here, why can't we also sell here but buy back here? Because just because someone's willing to buy here doesn't mean someone else isn't willing to sell way down here. That's exactly and when you have guys pounding the phone and starting to find the desperation people have. And I'm going to talk to you guys about some of the best opportunities right now is these renters who would now, these landlords who have renters who if 10% of my people stop paying and I'm really good at underwriting. Uncle Frank down the road who has a couple of renters was terrible. He didn't screen anybody. Like all of his people aren't paying. We're buying stuff that's generating 3% per month. So what the heck does that mean? We're buying a house for fifty thousand dollars. It's generating income of three percent a month. Guys, I don't care what the market does. This mass out, like it could go down to the tank. But if you're making three percent a month, you read, you watch Bigger Pockets and all that stuff. They say one percent is like the zenith, and I love to buy stuff for free and sell it to the guy for. The loves the one percent, like that's the best model ever. You buy things for a half million, and you you do a couple things, and you can go sell it over here for a million bucks. Like that is a really cool model when they listen to bigger pockets. So I think there's a great arbitrage out there looking yeah. for the people who will sell to you for two to three percent. They're harder to find, but they are out there and sell it to the guys for one percent. I think that is number one. So this guy's got Uncle Frank. Yep. It is weird that I have an Uncle Frank who's actually really kick-ass at real estate. So Everyone has an Uncle Frank. It's a different Uncle Frank. Yes. Uncle Frank has a house, 50000 He has a house. He bought it for whatever. He's willing to sell it to you at 50000 so you get a 3% return per month, right? Yep. And he already has a renter in there who's not performing. Is that what you're going after? Or? Some are performing, some are not performing. Right now I'm running hard at Section 8. Um, I'm okay. essentially kicking people out, evicting people. And we're just putting Section 8 people in there because guaranteed money. And I will <laughs> tell you right now, for houses in neighborhoods that aren't great, 300 applicants in two weeks. 300 people inquiring for houses in not great neighborhoods that you can't resell for the numbers I would want to get for it. 300 people want to rent my 30 and $40,000 houses for $950 a month. Wow. Okay. And the government says, oh, these people are in, I'll guarantee it. So we'll make you that payment on the first every month. People with jobs. Yeah. Well, and they're being moved from, as rent increases happen, mm. have happened in nicer areas, right? And they're being positioned that where they have to make a move, right? Their, their rent's gone up 30% in their apartment. So now they can actually get a house for a same or similar, maybe a little bit less in a section eight. They're more excited about that. They are 100% more excited. And number one, finding a house. Like if anyone has retail clients attempting to find a rental house right now, it is impossible. So as someone who owns property, this is your opportunity. People are getting priced out of this real estate market, 7% interest. We could talk about how to solve that. And we're solving it every day on the retail side, it's really easy. Um, but people are after rentals right now and you could charge the most insane numbers and buy it to the most insane numbers I've ever seen. So why not sell some of your portfolio up here to buy stuff? I'm talking buying stuff the same week at numbers down here. Why not trade it back, trade back and then figure out what to do with the profits. And we've talked about opportunity zones and that's where I'm gonna to go to next is what I'm doing with all of this cash we're generating out here because it's becoming substantial and we need to go park it somewhere. And I'm sure as heck I'm not paying capital gains. A lot of this stuff, short-term capital gains rates on this, this money we're bringing in. Um, Number two, opportunity. So that is opportunity number one. Number two is creative terms. People are willing to sell you stuff on terms, owner financing. And owner financing is one of the greatest things, not because I'm, you don't have to go to the bank, where you really make money on owner financing. And we did this 10 times so far this year, is you go back to stuff we bought a long time ago and realize you don't have. Uh, 
Lordstown was closing in Youngstown and it was like catastrophic. All the jobs were wiped out. Everyone knew somebody. Nobody could sell a house over $200,000 back at this time because everyone knew someone had lost a job. So we went in I don't know, five, six years ago, whenever it closed and bought everything up subject to. We, we Tons of paper. Uh, we bought houses for $160,000, gave them no money. We've been making payments for five years, making $1,800 a month in rent. And we were zero interest uh, on this stuff or, or whatever their mortgage interest was to cover it. And then you find out a lot of these people had their houses almost paid for it. Maybe they had a, a small second on it. What happens when you have a note with somebody and you're paying them $500 a month, two, three years goes by and they say, hey, Brad, will you pay off this note? Um, or, hey, I want to sell my house. And you go, dude, you don't own the house anymore. You own a piece of paper. And they go, that, oh, is that why people are calling to buy this note all the time? And I go, yeah. I go, why don't you go find out what they're willing to pay? And the example a couple of weeks ago, the guy was willing hundred an investor, I owed him 154,000, let's call it. And the investor was willing to pay him $118,000. And I said, dude, it's amazing. I was just about to call you and see if you'd take 120,000 to cancel this thing out. I'd love to pay off the whole thing that I don't have. I would do 120. So instead of your bank goes from 160, now you pay them off at 120. I do. $250,000. That's the magic of owner financing is the renegotiation of the debt. Of the and this not only works for houses, it works on apartments. And even better yet, you're going to find out where the next big moves are. And I think this game of real estate has played out for the most part is it works in businesses. You can go buy businesses today. Where do I think the number one opportunity? What are we running hard at? We're running hard at the people business. Because I don't think people have left the industry of working. I think they are sick of working at really crappy places and treated really crappy. I think the days of underpaying your staff and underpaying your people are over. I think stuffing people in a room, telling them to put their cell phones away and work eight to five, eight to six are over. So I think there's a massive opportunity. If we were was so wasn't so hard, why would we have 37 people signed up to our, to our real estate team on a commission only basis? Good people getting their license and spend money. So now we're running hard in the in the service industry because we're seeing a massive opportunity right now to go buy companies at two times multiples. What the heck does that mean? That means you had a lot of people during COVID. So you have you have two different groups. You have a bunch of boomers who are ready to retire who have run great companies. For me, this is HVAC plumbing and electric. This is what I'm buying. They've run really great companies and they found out they're really tired and they're ready to retire. And maybe they have a million dollars. One million dollars in revenue. An industry standard for the stuff is, let's just say they're all, they, they make a 20% margin, $200,000 a year. And say they're selling you two times multiple. It means you're paying $400,000 for this. Or in the middle of buying three of these companies right now. And we're going to buy a lot of these companies right now. So this guy's making $200,000 a year. He's willing to sell it for $400,000. What you're going to find out when you start approaching these people is nobody's buying their companies when they're this small. Because we've done a study and I've worked with a lot of investment bankers over the last six months on this. And I, and I have a lot of them who are friends and roommates of mine. And what you find out in the buying business world is anything sub 500,000 in NOI, net operating income, you're gonna pay anywhere from one and a half to two and a half times earnings. Okay. However, when you get the $2 million EBITDA or NOI, the multiples to sell these companies, they start at seven, sell these things at an auction, and they sell the 10 to 11 times earnings is what the standards are going to sell these companies once they get to $2 million of EBITDA. So from you pay two, you drive, these people are missing people, they're missing systems, they're missing CRMs. Things as operators in the real estate business, we call boomtown in sync. In the service industry, they're called service titan. You go into these companies, you take this 
people, you get a dispatcher, which we call admin in our business. You put a dispatcher in. You put a service site that we call boom. We know all of these things. We're already doing them. And then you do a lead generation, things that we call pay-per-click. We call them text. It's all the things we're already doing. We're going and seeing these people who are running these businesses who go, Brad, all of my customers are written down in this notebook with their invoices stapled to them. And I have them in crates and I have them for the last seven years and I'm paying storage for them. And I go, oh my God, we could take all of these people and put them into our CRM. And now we put them on marketing and we hire five guys in a dispatcher and we put them in a little piece of real estate. Oh, and guess what? We're real estate people. So we can structure the real estate deal better than anyone else can. And we could drive to $2 million EBITDA and I would guess 18 months. Or like we're doing it, we're doing what's called a roll-up, where we go and we buy companies. We're buying one company that already has the operator in place. He's making, he's a new guy. He started after COVID, but he has every license in the world. The most valuable license out there. He has no idea. Brad, to clarify, these service companies, we're talking what type of service? Plumbing, HVAC, um, and electrical is my jam. But it works for everything. Pool routes. Um, construction companies, excavating. I just know what I know. I have a background in construction. We run seven crews on our real estate team. I know these guys. Like I talk to these guys daily. I know how to run these guys. I run construction work. I just get this business. I get this little way of living. I just get it. I'm a blue collar guy from a blue collar place. This is what I get. Yeah. When I sit down and they go, oh, I don't know what I'm doing. It's baffling because we know exactly how to run this playbook. So this is what we're doing. We, we got an operator. The guy is making $400,000. I actually have it written down. I'm just structuring the deal. We just wrote the NOI this morning. And he's going to take it. The deal he's making, I'm not just going to tell you because it's probably really hard to see. He's making $390,000 in revenue. His NOI, he's going to say, is $128,000. But you find out the guy's not really paying himself. Uh, he's just taking his money out of the business. This sounds a lot like real estate agents. They really get going running. And they run really fast and they make a bunch of money and they just pay their bills out of it. And they really, they drive really high margin businesses, but they don't really have a business. Yep. And he's making 32.8% margins. And I know if I run really well and put my systems in place, I can get him to 20% margin. So let's structure the deal. And he thinks his company's worth 400,000. And I said, no, the company's worth 156,000. And initially he wanted to sell 57% of the company. I said, oh, dude, I can't do it. After talking to him, he's going to have a really hard time when I say, hey, Brad, thanks, Brad, Joe. Uh, we need to go buy seven trucks and we need to spend a half million dollars tomorrow. We're going to need to make this thing go really fast. He's going to probably puke all over his shoes if he's a 43% owner in this company. So we're buying 100% of the company. And then what we're doing is we're buying a couple other companies, ones for a million five. The ones so you're stroking for, in the check for 156. So we're not stroking a check. This is the be even better part. We're actually giving him no money. We're saying, Brad, you got $100,000 in the bank in this company. You take the money out. There's your 100 grand. We're going to move you from getting paid nothing to you're now the service manager, service manager, getting paid $70,000 in a salary. You're going to stay, you have to stay in your truck for 12 months or until you replace yourself. He already says he has the two guys to replace his, his revenue. So he's gonna stay in the truck till his two guys come over. Our $156,000 is going in the form of working capital. The working capital is going to trucks, CRMs, warehousing, and essentially having money in the bank to pay the salaries. Yeah, Until operate. the revenue catches up. Yep. Then we're bringing in two other companies. We're gonna do what's called a roll up. You buy one company, Another company, you roll it up into one company. And now we're giving Brad, he wanted to own 53% of what he thought was 390,000, which is really 156. He wanted to have a $50,000 equity position, essentially. We're going to give him 10% of a $2.5 million company. And now his position is worth 250,000. That we're owner finance. There's no other buyers out there when you're sub, when you're not making any more than $2 million, you're going to find out the buyers for these companies are us yeah. and other people who don't know what they're doing. Or you can get an operator who does know what they're doing. And we were, he was pitched by a bunch of guys who didn't know what they're doing and they're going with us because we have a clue what we're doing. Once you're under $2 million, you're going to get a really good deal. So we're going to give this guy essentially $250,000. But 
he has to earn that. And, and it's based on kind of a, a lot of these things you'll do an earn out, he's doing an earn in. So he's going to earn this equity share basis. He hitches all the KPIs that we want him to hit. So he's going to run the HVAC and the commercial HVAC and the plumbing, and he's going to roll this thing up. And we should do two and a half million dollars in EBITDA in probably the next 18 months. So two and a half EBITDA in a 10 times multiple is $25 million. You know, 90% of the $25 million in that exit will look something like 20 million bucks in about 18 months. 18 months, that's something like that. And you could do that multiple times in multiple states. Mm -hmm. Everyone on this call is doing some form of running really hard in doing an arbitrage where you go, that list agent failed to sell your house. It's an expired house. I can go ahead and put my technology and my marketing and I can sell that house and make five or $8,000. Or I could, Mr. Investor, I'm a wholesaler and I went out and I bought a bunch of properties and I bought those properties for X price and I can market them up and wholesale them and make five to $20,000. I'm doing the same thing here with business. That's exactly right. But I'm playing with a lot more zeros. Yeah. It's a hell of an arbitrage play. The same game. Mm -hmm. There's just a couple more zeros. in. Yeah. That's incredible. Um, do y'all have, I mean, I can sit and ask Brad questions for the next eight hours. However, I want to open it up to y'all. Do y'all have some questions for Brad? He's given us a great understanding of what's currently happening um, globally from an economic standpoint. Why to have confidence in where we're sitting today. And rather than sitting in fear, sitting with confidence in the U.S. dollar and the opportunities that exist. And now is the time to actually charge forward. Um, and he's given us three incredible lanes to go down. And what's, I, what's interesting about each of those lanes is actually the process is almost the same. The systems and models put around it are almost exactly the same. It's just a different vehicle, if that makes sense. Um, which speaks to, to your disciplines and understandings of business models. So if y'all have questions, unmute yourself, type them in the chat. In the meantime, I can ask Brad some questions. I don't mind. Um, Brad, so we talked about plumbing, HVAC, electrical, pool, you know, where do you, what was the lead generation for you to find these, you know, because it all starts, each of these vehicles all starts with one thing first, right? Looking at the opportunity, one, two, Lead generation. Where do you find the opportunity? We're all sitting here, ah, Jen, for a living. The same way we do everything else, right? So ah, on the retail thanks. side, we go after distressed sellers and non-owner occupants. When I'm looking for businesses, I just go, who has the license for the company I want to buy? And I go right to the state website and I download every one of those people that have the license. Oh, and we do the same thing. We skip trace them and we text them. Yep. Yep. We just put it all inside our old skip trace in text mobile and we mail them and it works exactly the same way. Or if you want to go the old fashioned route, you can go to the business brokers, but you'll find out dealing with business brokers is worse than dealing with real estate agents. These <laughs> people. That's true. We've listed a few businesses. <laughs> it's, uh, it's exciting. It's exciting dealing with these folks. Okay. So we lead generate, we put it in, as you say, because you like to make it sound so easy, just in the little, uh, you know, in the little wheel where out it spits the actual contact information, you then lead generate to them, phone call comes in, and you start the conversation. And it sounds like what? Sounds like, hey, you know what, Frank, we've been looking at buying, I'm a real estate guy, I own a real estate company and an investment company. I run a bunch of Big companies with seven crews, and I spent a ton of money on HVAC. And I thought, damn, I wish I owned an HVAC company. I don't know anything about HVAC, but I'm looking to buy an HVAC company. Do you know anyone thinking about retiring that wants to sell an HVAC company? By golly, I am. No shit. When can we sit and talk about your company? Perfect. I'm interested. So this brings us to Alex's question on Facebook. Alex said, what is the best resource you recommend to learn more about buying businesses? So now that you have Frank, who ironically, Frank owns everything you're trying to buy. Frank has his HEAC company, and now you're looking at structuring the deal, right? Because that's a lot of what we talk about in Be Wealthy is how do we structure these deals to optimize, to reduce our risk, mitigate risk, but optimize performance and return. 
how do you learn or what books have you utilized to learn how to structure that? Remember when I started this conversation, I said, I'm born like this. I can't, I don't know if there's a book where I go, where do you learn this? Because the structure of the deal is the exact same structure or the art of the deal that we do in real estate. So all the same avenues we read in books that we did, I am a podcast education junkie. So if I said there was one place, I'd be lying because I spend three to four hours a day, either reading or consuming information from somewhere. So is it the Roland Frasers of the world? Is it the Jason Calacanis of the world? Is it the Chamath Palahapitiya guys? Like where, whoever it is, all those guys are resources that I use every day to consume this data. The All In Podcast is a great podcast for this. Um, what's her name? Cody Sanchez. She's mm -hmm. contrarian. I think, I think a lot of people relate to her. If you don't follow her, she's great at buying small businesses. She's in the car washes in storage, which I got my PhD in car wash and storage on a summer vacation, this one. And I decided, oh, this is right here with the real estate business. Like we're at the top, that's going to go, no, that's not, you don't buy that today. You don't get Airbnbs in Florida today. Like that's a great opportunity. All the Airbnb bros are blowing up because they went in with four of their bros and they were going to get $20,000 a month. And this would be awesome until people stop traveling for $20,000 a week. And it's not awesome anymore. Go buy those subject too. They have awesome notes on those, usually 3%. Go buy those. Awesome. Um, Andrew Dunn mentioned Buy Then Build is a good book on it. So if y'all want to take a look at that one, I have not read that. I don't know if you have, Brad. I have not read that one, no. Okay. Um, I love that you told the story, you know, about two, two and a half years ago with your son, having the decision of in six months, can we make a million dollars? And in six months, you found a creative way in what you knew how to do and made 2.2 million. And then you're sitting here two years later saying, okay, let's extend the runway a little and look at a different arbitrage. And you're saying, I can put this amount of work in today and 24 months or two years from now, I can make a five to 8% arbitrage on some businesses, which by the way, these dudes, Frank, doesn't have a lot of options. You're changing the trajectory None. of his life as well. So you're not only helping Frank, helping an investor Insisted. you took an investor on, helping, um, well, you didn't take an investor on because you didn't have any necessarily in capital deal, but you're helping Frank, you're helping create a better service for the end user, and you're packaging a really great business opportunity with systems and models that can be purchased by a larger conglomerate. And I think at the end of the day, sometimes when you look at, you know, I'm going to be a girl for a second. When you watch Pretty Woman, right? And Richard Gere is really into arbitrage and it's like, oh, he's in the dirty business. If only he made jobs. I think if we actually look at the way of what Brad is structuring and what Brad is doing, Brad's doing an incredible amount of good for the organization and an incredible amount of good for the community. Um, and bringing in, he's bringing in jobs. He's increasing the economy, not only from service provided, but also products purchased. He needs to buy new trucks. He needs to buy all these pieces. If you look at the arbitrage game as a way to actually take what exists, add value systems and models and create something better, I think it's a really, really cool game to be in. To end on that thought, the game is that to lean into people. And I will tell you the best part of this deal right here is that two installers happen to be Colombian. These two Colombians are the best installers on the planet. In fact, Train went to them and said, can we do a spread of magazine on how you install? Because everything's so clean. And I said, I went to this meeting and I, I have this thesis on the folks coming into this country and they're coming in here to earn better lives and better livings. If we yeah. can lean into these folks and pay them real wages, these are the most fiercely loyal people on the planet. And if I can go to my Colombians and I can recruit other people just like them and I can become fluent in Spanish and hire these loyal people and pay them a real living wage, do you understand what that's going to do for your life in their life at the same time? That's exactly right. It's pretty impressive. So Brad, as always, this hour went by so fast. Every time I talk to you um, at every mastermind, I'm like gleaning all the information that I can. So I will see you next month and have 9 million follow-up questions. Um, but I did want to go ahead and let everyone know that if you have more questions for Brad, or if you want to learn more about um, these conversations that we have of different ways to look at investment opportunities and evaluate assets and 
and strengthen that wealth building business alongside your current retail real estate business or investment business. You can book a call here. Um, if you have specific questions for Brad, Brad, how can they best get in touch with you? You can find me on Facebook. Um, that's probably the easiest way to get me on Facebook. I respond okay. there. Perfect. Brad, I can't thank you enough. This was super impactful. I have like pages of notes and I am going to text you some other questions that I have. So I'll need seven more minutes of your time if you'd be so gracious. Anytime, Kayla. I appreciate you guys and Brad and everything. You guys have changed my life as well. All right, guys. Thanks so much. Have a good one. We'll talk to y'all soon. Thanks.